I'm sure one way or another, everyone is affected by the events of the past week, the inauguration of a new president, the sight of Donald Trump leaving Washington once and for all. And whatever mixture of reactions of relief or anticipation you might feel. All in all, it's a reminder that we are living and practicing within history at a particular time, in a particular place. Sometimes in spiritual practices, we can fall into the assumption that what we're doing is reaching for something that is timeless, something that stands outside of culture and history. In Zen, the most um, explicit uh, reference to history is in the lineage. where we trace the transmission of the Dharma step by step back to Shakyamuni and even back before him to mythical Buddhas. And we're to imagine a kind of unbroken chain that as it stretches over two millennia and from India to China and Japan to America, the primary lesson that it's meant to convey is that the realization of each of those ancestors and patriarchs is in some sense identical to the realization available to us today. It is precisely a kind of assertion of a timeless ahistorical truth. We can read stories in the old koan collections about the idiosyncratic behavior of different masters and remark on how this one had an incredible facility with language but that one just sat in silence or hit with a stick or a shout. And all these stylistic differences though are in some way meant to convey a common truth. When we sit, we sit and feel our body breathe. And in doing so, our mind may become very clear. Thoughts may seem to cease for a while. We may just have that pure physical sensation of inhalation and exhalation. It may feel like for a while that the rest of our body drops away. There's just breath, no thought, no body, just this awareness hanging there in space.
And that kind of concentrated awareness can remind us of the idiosyncratic or arbitrary content of our moment to moment thought. That all that is transient and in some sense unreal. But it can seduce us in a way into imagining that our true nature is to be found in this kind of timeless formlessness of pure awareness, separated from body, separated from the ordinary contents of consciousness, separated from where we find ourselves in time and culture and history. Those kinds of experiences are in their own sense valuable. But I think that my practice always comes back to the fact that as I feel my body breathe, I'm feeling my breath in the body of a 71 year old man sitting in a chair because his ankles and knees are too stiff to sit cross-legged. Uh, I'm feeling the breath in my particular body here and now in its particular condition. And then I'm not sure that the point of our practice is to get into some state that allows me to imagine that it's just the same now as when I was 30. I can do that for a little bit. But I'm always then reminded that uh, Choco wanted to call sessions intensives, not retreats. Some of the bits I've been posting lately on Facebook about Heidegger, I've engaged with this, uh, his picture of history uh, and been thinking about it in contrast to the sometimes timeless ahistorical way of thinking we encounter uh, in Buddhism. For Heidegger, what we are is inseparable from when we are. Being is inseparable from time. He says we are the kind of being preoccupied with the nature of our being, with our becoming the sort of being we can possibly be. We don't have a fixed essential nature. We have to discover or create one or find one in our being in the world, in our embeddedness, in a time and place, culture and set of practices. And because we're fundamentally defined by that sense of possibility and potentiality, the future is built into our very notion of the present, the very notion of who we are is inseparable from what is it that we're becoming.
and the possibilities of what are we becoming are always in some sense in relationship to our finitude, to the reality of our death, which in Heidegger doesn't just mean that one day sometime in the future, I'm going to die and my life is over, but rather that every day I am alive, I face the possibility of the closure off of possibility of becoming this, but not that. And because we are beings preoccupied with possibility, we are also automatically engaged with our past because the past is the ground of what's possible for us. He says we're thrown into a particular situation. We are born into a world that defines who and what we are and what we can be. And the possibilities that we develop always must arise out of that ground that we find ourselves in. He says that uh, we never uh, should imagine that we can get behind our thrownness, that we're not going to ever be able to step outside our particular time and place. There's never going to be the possibility of a view from nowhere or a possibility of somehow freeing ourselves of all sorts of uh, conditioning. What he does say is that we can become aware of that conditioning and its essential groundlessness, its nullity, or Buddhists would say emptiness. And that when we see the basic groundlessness of our practices, this gives us a great deal more freedom or wiggle room in how we operate within them. He says ordinary people simply are tranquilized by conformity to what's ordinarily going on around them, what they're born into. That there's a kind of uh, sheep-like passive acceptance of norms that we take for granted and call common sense. But it's possible to see what those norms are. We're not able to step outside them completely. But we can see that history has provided us and those around us with a great variety of options. And he says in a uh, one brief passage, we are able to choose our hero. That we are able it's to some degree to resolutely and consciously choose what is most authentic or valuable among the options presented to us by our situation. Now, I think that that is, uh, in a certain way, always the attitude I've had towards teaching and lay practice. 
I'm not simply the recipient of a unchanging Dharma that I'm doing my best to hand down to the next generation. But that the Dharma itself is always shaped by and thus made relevant to its particular time and place and culture. And then what I'm doing and what we're doing here is always situated in the contemporary life that we're living. That we see that how we practice is very much up to us. Uh, we don't have here and now the option of simply living Dogen's life in a monastery following all the rules that he set out in that form of life and continuing his dharma by trying to imitate the life in you know, 12th century Japan to the best of our ability. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's how much we can and must be adaptable to changing circumstances. That sitting together can now mean sitting together remotely. The, to, the whole meaning of together has changed for us as it should. Who we are and what we're doing is a work in progress. And it's work that's taking place here and now in history. Our sitting may give us momentary experiences of the empty, of the timeless, of a moment of presence in which it seems that everything drops away except our pure awareness. But really our practice is to always come back from that, to be here, to be now in all its specificities at this time and in this body. <clears throat> 